Well, we are going to continue on. We're moving on in this uh, short little mini teaching series that I'm doing called Afterlife, where we're just taking out a few weeks to explore the question, what happens when we die? Uh, it's an important question, right? What, what happens when we die? Last week, I'll just fill you in. If you missed it, you can pick it up on any our website, YouTube, podcast, all that kind of stuff. But I'll just fill you in if you missed it. Uh, last week, we just kind of stated uh, the fact that unless Jesus comes back, we will die. A recent study showed that one out of every one people dies. (laughs) Unless Jesus comes back, we will die. You got to find humor somewhere, okay? Um, Upon death, our spirit separates from our bodies until Jesus returns. Upon his return, we will be resurrected just like Jesus was in a new glorified physical body. And then at that time, we will face judgment. Uh, There's two different judgments outlined in the scriptures. First is the great white throne judgment. That's for unbelievers. And then there's the judgment seat of Christ. That's for those who are following Jesus where we will be judged and rewarded for what we did for Christ in this life. And last week, we just kind of anchored on that thought that, that what we do now matters, right? It just does, right? We are saved by grace, but we are rewarded for works. Then that was last week. Now, uh, next week, I have a, it's really good news ne- next week, okay? Next week, it's going to be great. I, I've already started uh, penning down some thoughts, and we're just going to have a whole message on the new heavens and the new earth. It's going to be great and uplifting, and you're not going to want to miss it. This week, on the other yeah, you're saying, uh-oh. Yeah, this week, however, um, uh, we're going to talk about the alternative to heaven, and that is hell. Uh, that's what I'm going to spend my time on now. And even as I say that, I'm just keenly aware that in this moment, there's people in this room or online that this is the first time you've ever heard me speak. And, and, and you might be thinking, what kind of church is this? Do they talk about hell all the time? Answer, yes, every single Sunday. This, no, no. Um, uh, it's not. This is, this is a part of a series, again, that we're doing on the afterlife. But it is a very important subject for us to tackle as a church. I, I actually remember, I was thinking about this, I, I don't know if, if you can do this, but I can remember the first time that I was introduced to hell or the, the concept of, of hell. I was probably six or seven years old and I don't remember all of the events that, that took place, but at some point I turned over and I called my friend a fool. And it was in that moment that a Christian lady, who probably was well-intentioned at the time, turned to me very sternly and said, Danny, don't you ever call anybody a fool. Don't you know that if you do, you will go to hell. And it was in that moment that when she said that to me, I, I, I promise, when she said the word hell, it reverberated in my mind. It was like, hell, 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 hell. <laughs> like it was... It was traumatic. I didn't know what hell was. I didn't know what was happening there. But judging by the tone in her voice, I knew it was a place that I didn't want to go. Right? And, and, and the reality is, for, for, for some of us in this room, we can actually pinpoint the time and the place and the circumstances of when we were first introduced to this topic. Right? Why? Because it's weighty. Like, it is... It is terribly weighty. I mean, just just listen to this. Peter Kreft says it this way. Of all the doctrines in Christianity, hell is probably the most difficult to defend, the most burdensome to believe, and the first to be abandoned. I mean, is that not true? Like, Like many, many people today abandoning the very thought of hell uh, in large part because of how burdensome it is. It is a weighty subject. C.S. Lewis, one of the most predominant theologians of our recent time, said it this way. He says, there is no doctrine 
which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than the doctrine of hell if it lay in my power. But, big but there, it has the support of scripture and especially of our Lord's own words and it has always been held by the Christian church and it has the support of reason. Now, Now listen, I don't know about you, but I so resonate with what Lewis is saying. Like, I was actually thinking about this. If, if it were up to Danny Gray and I can remove one thing from the Christian faith, it would be this conversation today. It would. Like, if, if, if it were up to me and I had the power to somehow remove something, it would be hell. I would get rid of hell. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. Because it doesn't make me feel good. And if it does make you feel good, that's like another whole problem. It shouldn't, right? It, it shouldn't, but, but here's the problem with that line of thinking, that what our, our feelings, right? What, what feels good and right is not always the best way to figure out what's true. Just because something feels good doesn't mean it's right. And just because something feels bad doesn't mean that it's wrong. We can be repelled by an idea and it still be 100% true all the time, right? And the reason why I'm stating this is because before I preach, and I'm not even preaching yet, but, but before we really get into this, I'm stating this because many of us, your struggle is gonna be your feelings this morning. As, as, as we look at scripture and the pictures that they paint, it's not going to feel good. It doesn't feel good for me to communicate them. It's probably not going to feel good for you to hear them. But we must, we must get past our feelings this morning and actually search truth at a deeper level. I said, are, are, are you, you ready to go? Okay, Pastor Mark... Hazard used to have this thing that he said. He said, like, buckle your seatbelts. Uh, it's, it's, it's about to get a little bumpy. Um, I, I was trying to think, okay, how, how do you lay out a sermon on hell? You know, uh, when I started my study, honestly, I could probably do an entire series on the different aspects and implications of hell. But what I want to do just today, I, I, I'm going to attempt to ask and answer three different questions. Three, I think, very vital, pivotal questions that'll maybe help us in our understanding. Here's the first one. What is hell? Why don't we just start there? What is, well, let me, let me ask the question to you, okay? Uh, when you think about hell, what images come to mind? Just literally yell it out at me. Fire. Fire. <laughs> just so happens, tech team, let's, let's, let's get some fire up in here. We, uh, it's not real. I have used this as a prop. I don't even know how many times. This is like my, my go-to, usually not talking about hell. But uh, fire, Th- this is uh, the predominant image that comes to mind, and there's kind of good reason for that. The, the Bible uh, references fire a lot. Uh, hell is called the fiery furnace an unquenchable fire, a lake of fire, burning sulfur, right? There's, my, my point is there's a lot of fire reference when it comes to hell. But interestingly, it's not all fire. There are other images given. Uh, hell is called outer darkness with no light. It's described as a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's described as the one place that exists where somehow you can be separated from the presence of God, which is terrifying. Like, horrible stuff. In fact, there's not one picture given in all of the scriptures about hell that's positive. It's all bad. Like, it's, it's all bad. It's, it's literally the worst. That's, that's why it has the connotation, right? It's hell. It's, it's all bad. In this all bad place, Jesus actually references a lot. He talks about hell more than he talks about heaven. And I'm just going to show you a few of these. Over to the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah, Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, um, 
he says this, Matthew 5, 29, he says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go into hell. Now, let's just be very clear. Jesus is not pro plucking out your eyes and cutting off your hands. Okay, this is hyperbole. He's using hyperbolic language to stress a point, and that point is hell. Right? It's, he's, he's stressing how bad this reality is. You just skip a few chapters down. When Jesus was kind of commissioning and sending out some of his followers, Matthew 10, 28, he said this, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one, that's capitalized, one, God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Or how about when Jesus was confronting the Pharisees? And he says this, Matthew 23, 33. He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Whew. You know, it's this interesting thing that, that people do with Jesus. Because they don't actually read the words of Jesus, but they're kind of like, out there in the world, there's a lot of people that are like against the church and we're like, well, we don't agree with the church, but we love Jesus, right? Which is a really bizarre thing to say. But, but, but really what people mean is they like certain aspects of what Jesus taught, but definitely not all of it. Like, I don't know many people that have actually read this part that, that aren't saying, oh, I love Jesus' teaching, right? Like, here it is. He talks about often this place called hell. Now, what's really interesting is that in these passages that I just read for you and in some others, Jesus doesn't use the word hell. He doesn't. He's actually using a word called Gehenna. Now, this is, this is very important to the conversation today. Gehenna was a very real place. It was like a a garbage dump of sorts that was just south of Jerusalem, and it was a place where they would uh, burn waste and sewage in flesh. The fire of Gehenna would never go out. It would burn all day and all night. It was where they would throw dead animals, the carcasses of dead animals. This is where they would throw a lot of uh, dead bodies of criminals uh, that in large part were crucified. Uh, they would then throw them on the fires of Gehenna. It was, it was an atrocious place. Maggots infested Gehenna. And historians would actually write about the smell of Gehenna. It just, just like the stench would rise and just carry and this is the picture that Jesus uses often to describe hell. Now, because Jesus was using an actual earthly location to talk about an eternal reality, we humans get in all sorts of silly arguments. So we'll say, well, well, well if, he was, if Gehenna was an actual real place at that time, then, 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 then how do we know that, that, that hell is literal fire? And, and if it is literal fire, how can it be also called outer darkness at the same time? Doesn't fire give off light? And if we can't know that, then all of a sudden, we, you know, we begin to think, well, hell might not be that bad. Right? Maybe it's not as bad as what we were led to believe. And, and like a house of cards, it all just comes tumbling down. Can I just tell you, it's called metaphor. The Bible uses several different metaphors to describe this place called hell. Again, none of them are good, but, it, but I, I just take the same position uh, with guys like Jonathan Edwards who came before me and said, wherever the scripture uses metaphor, it simply means that it cannot be described. So it's probably worse. When we, when we come to some of these metaphors and we get all these silly arguments, well, what can we know? What can we not know? Here's what we know. It's bad. Okay? There's no reality unless you completely twist Scripture. There is no reality that we can walk away from other than an acknowledgement that whatever this hell place is, it's the worst. Like, and it, it brings me you no know, joy, right? But it's, it's just what it is. 
It, it is the worst. It is something that if we actually began to grasp how bad this place is, we would never wish for, for our greatest enemy to go there. Never. It is horrible. So we still have to answer the question, what is it? What is hell? Based upon my study of scripture and the lengths that Jesus goes to in describing it, I'll say it this way. Hell is a nonstop, personal, isolated experience of suffering and unending pain. And that statement doesn't make me feel good. But just because it doesn't make me feel good doesn't mean it's wrong. I'm going to say it one more time. Hell is a nonstop, personal, isolated experience of suffering and unending pain. That's what hell is. Ready to go to question number two? I got to smile at some point. Let's go to question number two. I think this is a really good question. Okay, so if that's what it is, why does hell exist? Right? Why would God create such a place? I think that's a fair question, right? And there's kind of a couple different ways that, that I can answer it. But the, the, the primary way, and I'll lay this before us, is this. Hell exists for God to deal righteously with Satan. The primary reason why hell exists is for God to deal righteously with Satan. For many people today, even inside of the church, we have a very skewed theology, a very kind of misinformed understanding of Satan and hell, right? Hollywood has kind of painted this picture that, that hell is where Satan lives. It's kind of like his home. And then every now and then he kind of comes up to mess with us humans and then goes back. And then if we're really bad, then what happens is we go there where forever we're going to be tormented by the devil and his minions as they poke us with pitchforks, right? Like, but like for real, like, like, I don't want to laugh too hard there because probably several people might actually believe that in this room, right? That, that, that this is the place where, where it, like, like it's, it's the devil's land. The devil owns hell. The devil runs hell. Man, I've even read books. I've listened to testimonies of people who have had near-death experiences claim to have gone to hell, and this is what they've seen. The only problem with this <laughs> is going to be the scripture, okay? Hollywood does not inform our theology. The Bible does. I want to read for you Revelation 20, verse 10. This is speaking of a future reality. And it says this, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You have to get this into your head. Hell is not the place where the devil lives. Hell is not the place where the devil torments anybody. Hell is the final destination for the devil where he himself will be tormented. It was created, Matthew 25, Jesus actually says that hell was created for this purpose. That's why there's a hell. And, and, and quite honestly, it wasn't just Hollywood. It wasn't just Hollywood that kind of messed with people's ideas, man. Even sometimes inside of the church, our theology wasn't right. Like, like we, we used to run here, and, and I'm not casting shade or doubt on anyone, but like we used to run that production. We ran here for a long time, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. I acted in that, okay? And it's like, this is not like a proud point for me. I was the devil, and I was also kind of courting Natalie at the time. I don't know if her mom liked that idea of me being the devil, but, <laughs> but it was interesting. It was right up here, and Hell was on this side of the stage, and uh, people would die, in this play, they would then stand before the judge, and if they didn't accept Jesus, then all the angels went like this. And then all of a sudden, the flames would come up over hell, and I would come out dressed up as the devil. And I worked on my maniacal laugh. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was, I'm just, I'm impressed with myself right there. In and literally, what would happen is I would come out on the stage, and I would drag men and women kicking and screaming back into hell. 
And that was the image that was painted of this is apparently how it works. Again, the problem is going to be the scriptures. Okay? Hell. Hell is not the devil's land. It's not where the devil lives. It's not, it's not where he's going to torment people. It is his damnation. Do we understand this? We, okay, we, we just have to come to terms with that. And that's an exciting point, okay? Because we shouldn't be buddy-buddy with the devil, right? There should be a side of us, like the devil is the liar. He's the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There is a spiritual war being raged against us every single moment of every single day. But there is a day where he will be, where he will be judged, that's the first reason why hell exists. The second reason is this, and this one's not as popular as the first, but it's that hell exists for God to deal righteously with the unrepentant. Yeah, we're all rah, rah, get the devil. Not so much on this one. Second Thessalonians 1, 8, 9 says this, that he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, Parkwood, if that doesn't create a pause in you, honestly, I don't know what will. The problem is just that most people don't believe it. They use that Peter Kreft quote in the beginning, right? Hell's the first thing that we drop, right? It's... We don't want to believe that. In fact, I mean, you can look up studies. If we were just to go around in our workplaces, our world right now, North America, interestingly, only 40% of people believe that there is a hell. And then, get this, out of that, only one half of 1% believe they're going there. 99.5% of people believe that if there's a hell, surely it's not for them, right? It's just for the really, 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 really bad people out there, maybe like a Hitler, but me? Nah, I'm good. I'm good. Why? Because I, I, I'm a good person. God, God's not going to send good people to hell. This is really just one of those areas where, again, what the world says and what the scripture says, man, it's in like stark contrast. The world right now wants to tell you that you're a good person. It's the scriptures that say no one is good, no, not one. It's the scripture, or it's the world right now that, that wants to speak out and just says, trust your heart, right? It's, it's the Bible that speaks and says that the heart is deceptively wicked and no one can trust it. It's the world that says, you know, just believe in yourself. It's the, it's the Bible that says, no, 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 believe in Jesus. Man, he's your only hope. It's not you, right? This is an area where just what, what the culture around us is saying and what the scripture says could not be more different. We're not good. And I'm, I, I promise you, I promise you, I'm not up here trying to, like, offend people. I, it's, that's, that's, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to be honest with what the Scripture says, man. We're not good. Every single one of us, we have been born with a sin nature. Now, I always get a kick out of this because some people try to fight this. <laughs> They're like, no, we haven't. I can prove it to you. Okay, you ready? Okay, take any two toddlers in the entire world, put them in, in a room with one toy, and watch what happens. Sin. <laughs> For real, they will be selfish. They'll get angry pretty quick, and if we leave them long enough, man, it might even get violent. And here's the thing. No parent has ever sat down with their two-year-old and said, hey, little Billy, today we're going to have sin lessons. Today I'm going to teach you how to bite. No. No parent has ever done that, and yet what happens? Our kids bite. Why? Because humanity, man, we've been born with this sin nature, and actually the older we get, the more aware we become of this. And so we've, we've got a choice to make, right? Like, what do we do with this problem that shows up in two- and three-year-olds? Some just pretend like it's not there, right? 
And, and man, that's, that's like rampant in our world right now. That, that whole idea, you're not a good person, man. Like there is a strong message saying, yes, you are. Don't, don't listen to anything else. You're, you're A+. Plus. You know, you pretend like your sin's not there. For others, and this is also a massive group, we just pretend like it's not that bad. Right? It's like, well, yeah, I mean, sure. I lied, cheat, stole, whatever. But I only did it once, and it, like, it's not like I robbed a bank. It's not like I actually murdered somebody. Right? And so what we do is we, is we try to minimize it. Like, really, this is what people got to do. The, the more we grow up, the more we become aware of this problem that plagues humanity. But the choice is yours. And this is what I just need you to understand. The choice is yours. We can keep on pretending or we can throw ourselves on the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. The one we just sang songs earlier, the one that 2 uh, Corinthians 5, I believe 21, says that, that he who knew no sin became our sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, right? Like, like but it, it's your choice. We can either minimize, pretend like it's not there, or we can throw ourselves on the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I I, I wanna be very clear on on this. Every eyeball, every earball right here, okay? God does not send anybody to hell. I'm gonna say that again. God does not send anybody to hell. What he does is he honors our choice. People who want God here get God there. People who do not want God here, do not want to submit to his authority, do not want to acknowledge his grace and his mercy in any way, then what eventually will happen, right, is that he will give them what they've always wanted in eternity separated from himself. It was Lewis who said that hell is the greatest monument to human freedom that has ever existed. Hmm. What is hell? It is a nonstop, personal, isolated experience of suffering and unending pain. Why does hell exist? For God to deal righteously with Satan and the unrepentant. And I do have one more question, and it's this. And I really wrestled over how to ask this question, so hopefully you get it. Does the punishment fit the crime? What I mean by that is, anybody here ever had the thought, isn't hell a little bit of like overkill? Right? Like we, we live, for some of us, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, and then apparently we're going to be judged, and then... And then we're going to go and there's, we're going to have this reality for the rest of eternity. It, it's overkill. Does the punishment fit the crime? Well, here's how I would somewhat answer this. What we have to understand is that any punishment, any punishment, even today, it's not based on how long it takes someone to commit the crime. A punishment is based on the weightiness of the crime. You understand? It's not based on how long it took to commit. You can kill somebody in seven seconds. You're not going to go to jail for seven seconds, right? The the punishment is not based on how long it took, but rather the weightiness. Let let, let me try to explain this. If if, if I was after church today, I'm I'm driving home, and uh, I'm turning onto my street, and all of a sudden my neighbor's cat runs out on the street, and I just pummel it, just drive over it, and I kill the cat. The neighbor sees this. So he comes outside and he's like, Danny, man, you just killed my cat. I'm like, I know, I, I, tr- I tried, it wasn't on purpose. Question, do you think this man's going to call the cops on me? Probably not. Okay, now let's change the story a little bit. What if I'm on my way home today, I turn onto my street, but instead of it being a cat that ran out, it was a 25-year-old man runs right out in front of my car, boom, I hit him, kill him, dead on the street. The neighbor sees what happens. He comes out and says, Danny, what's going on? You just killed this man. Question, do you think he's going to call the cops then? Absolutely. If he doesn't, that's, that's a weird neighbor, right? 
Like, like, like what we need to understand, right, is that the punishment is not based on how long it took, but the weightiness of it. I, I, I want us to see this clearly. Our problem is not that we have sinned. Our problem is who we have sinned against. God. God. I'll, 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 I'll explain it this way. In uh, the Old Testament, there's this story King David. King David did a lot of really good things. He, he had these moments where he excelled, and he had really embarrassing moments as well. This would be one of them. There's one day King David is up in his palace, and he's kind of surveying the land, and he sees this woman named Bathsheba. Uh, she's on her rooftop bathing naked. So King David sees her, lust after her, And then what he does is he summons her to the palace. She doesn't really have a choice at this point in a lot of what's happening here. He sleeps with her, impregnates her, and then when he finds out that she's pregnant, he kills Bathsheba's husband just so that he won't get caught. Okay? That's a bad day. Or more than a day. That's a bad string of events. You got lust, adultery, possibly rape, murder, all wrapped up in this. As a result of that situation, David wrote Psalm 51. Psalm 51 in the scriptures is a direct response to everything that I just told you. And I want to read for you just one verse, Psalm 54 verse, sorry, 51 verse 4. David says this to God. He says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, to be very clear here, David is not saying, I didn't violate a woman. I, I, I didn't murder anybody. No, man, David is broken over what he did to this woman and to her husband. He is broken over this. But what David's articulating is that our sins are not just horizontal amongst one another, but that there's this vertical aspect of our sin. And this is what we need to understand in order for us to ever understand the topic of hell. What makes it so bad is not that we have sinned, but who we have sinned against. A holy and just God. Parkwood, God is holy and God is just. He cannot be holy without being just, and because he's just, he must punish wrongdoing. He must. And I would actually argue that none of us wanna live in a reality where this were not true. None of us. When we read about little children in the Middle East that are being decapitated simply because they were born into a Christian family, something inside of us cries out for justice. Years ago, when I was on the streets of India in the red light district doing a mission trip, not hanging out by the way, but man, when I was there and I watched this probably 10 year old girl with makeup slapped on her like a doll, and a 60-year-old man grab her by the wrist and yank her into a back room. Oh, you better believe that there was something inside of me that was crying out, God, do something. Do something. This is wrong. See, the the reality is that none of us wanna live in a reality where God, we're not just. Just for us, we just don't want to be on the receiving end of it. And the good news this morning, the good news this morning is that you don't have to be. Because God is not only just, God is love. Love is not something that God does, it's who he is. You say, okay, well, how do we know How do we know? Because of the cross. Let let me me explain something to you. If hell at its core is separation from God, 
If that's what hell is at its core, then listen to the words, to some of the last words of Jesus as he hung and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, it was on the cross that Jesus endured hell so we don't have to. It was on the cross that Jesus experienced hell so we don't have to. This is the marvel of God's great love. You wanna know the love of God, look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ.